Thank you. As has been noted by others, women are in short supply in <laughs> subjects for this conference. Women are seldom the block that makes a difference in the political outcome. Women are not often candidates themselves, and so are not often elected. A few Mormon women have been notably involved. Ivy Baker Priest was the US treasurer from 1953 to 1961, and her signature appeared on all US currency then issued. Paula Hawkins served in the US Senate from Florida from 1980 to 1986. Esther Egertson Peterson was a consumer advocate, both as an activist and as an official under several US presidents. But in legal realms, women have traditionally been considered extensions of their husbands and fathers rather than individuals in their own right. Although there have been three recent female secretaries of state in the United States, political women are more often seen as the silent, tight-lipped, supporters of their husbands, caught in flagrant misbehavior. <laughs> Mormon women, uh, largely considered obedient to authority and lacking in ambition to challenge male leadership, would be considered unlikely to have spoken out on political matters. However, Utah Miss Seraph Young, is that not a great name? A niece of Brigham Young was the first woman to vote with full suffrage in the United States. She was the first woman at the polls in Salt Lake City on February 21, 1870. The Utah women also voted in the general state election in September 1870. The territorial legislature of Wyoming had passed the women's suffrage measure on December 10, 1869, just two months before Utah passed hers on February 12, 1870. In Utah then had an election first. Utah's women voted from 1870 until 1887, when the right of suffrage, which had been granted by the territorial governor and legislative assembly, was withdrawn by the National United States Congress in the Edmunds Tucker Act as part of the effort to combat Utah's polygamy. Utah's women voted for 17 years and then did not vote for 19 years. When Utah became a state in 1896, Utah entered with equal suffrage. Her women gained the vote, lost it, and got it back many years before 1920 when women's suffrage became the law of the land. Mormon women have acted politically on a number of occasions, mostly at the request of the men in their church, sometimes in opposition. They have left lasting records of their activity in print and in memory. And today I want to recall a few of the stirring voices some of those women have spoken with. Their rhetoric is often thrilling and heartfelt as they speak for their own positions against real and assumed opposition. For my longer paper, I'll speak on four occasions uh, when Mormon women spoke on political matters. For this shorter paper today, I will speak on three. The consideration of the Cullen Bill at the time that suffrage was established in 1870, the undated Utah Suffrage Songbook of the 1880s or 90s, and Thoughts on California's Proposition 8 in 2007. In 1870, Shelby Moore Cullum, representative from Illinois, introduced stringent anti-Mormon legislation in the legislature of the United States. The Cullum Bill prompted the Utah Mormon women to hold mass meetings protesting its passage. The women showed themselves as effective political speakers as well as voters. Their remarks have been partially credited with the defeat of the bill. Historians have noted that Utah's women suffrage was instigated to combat plural marriage by enlisting Mormon women to fight their male and church-induced oppression. If so, the mass meetings are evidence of a failed strategy. The Cullen Bill passed the National House of Representatives but died in the Senate, roudly opposed by the militant Mormon women in the Salt Lake Tabernacle. The Mormon feminists passionately defended their way of life and perhaps the best speech by Mormon High Priestess and Relief Society Presidentess, as she liked to be referred to, Eliza R. Snow, contains many ringing phrases. She forcefully contends that women stay in Mormonism by choice, that they could leave at will, that they have more freedom than anyone else, 
they choose to stay as the best possible living situation. Snow contends that Mormon women are so devoted to their cause that they have willingly done what they could never have been forced to do. I love this reasoning. They are not only not enslaved, but they have chosen and preferred to do harder work than slaves. And here's a taste of that speech. I will now ask this intelligent assembly of ladies, do you know of any place on the face of the earth where a woman has more liberty, where she enjoys more high and glorious privileges as she does here as a Latter-day Saint? No, the history of this people would show at once that the part which woman has acted in it could never have been performed against her will. Amid the many distressing scenes through which we have passed, the privations and hardships consequent on our expulsion from state to state and our location in an isolated, barren wilderness, the women in this church have performed and suffered what could never have been born and accomplished by slaves. These refined women identify themselves as true helpmeets and counselors to their husbands in tones that suggest the Declaration of Independence. Were we the stupid, degraded, heartbroken beings that we have been represented, silence might best become us. But as women of God, women filling high and responsible positions, performing sacred duties, women who stand not as dictators, but as counselors to their husbands, and who, in the purest, noblest sense of refined womanhood, being truly their helpmeets, we not only speak because we have the right, but justice and humanity demand that we should. The proceedings of this mass meeting were published in 1870, and I think that this strong early feminist credo stands with Elizabeth Cady Stanton's 1848 Declaration of Sentiments. Mormon women lost the franchise in 1887 when the federal Edmonds-Tucker Act, a stringent anti-polygamy bill, snatched back that privilege by preventing all Utah women from voting. Under extensive pressure, the Mormon church discontinued plural marriage in 1890, and Utah joined the union in 1896 with women's suffrage. A more lighthearted contribution for Mormon women was the Mormon suffrage songbook a publication of words to be sung to familiar tunes at suffrage rallies. This undated songbook, priced 10 cents, would have been published between 1887 and 1896. I wish that I had proposed a singing session for this conference <laughs> where we could have sung some of these lively songs, but I can't resist at least bringing up one. The best of these songs is called Woman Arise. No author is credited, but it has an LDS tune, Hope of Israel, by William Clayson. It's short, the words and music work well, the attractive perkiness, rather than the super virtuous tone often seen, make it a winner. And its short whole goes like this. I'll read the first verse. <laughs> Freedom's daughter, roused from slumber, see the curtains are withdrawn, which so long thy mind hath shrouded. Lo, the day begins to dawn. Now I'm going to sing the chorus. Woman, rise thy pen and soar. Sit thou in the dust no more. Seize the scepter, hold the van. Equal with thy brother man. Now you remember that. Right? <clears throat> now I'm going to read you the second verse, and then you have to sing the chorus with me. <laughs> OK. This is the second verse. Truth and virtue be thy motto. Temperance, liberty, and peace. Light shall shine and darkness vanish. Love shall reign, oppression cease. Remember, woman rise, thy penance o'er. Sit thou in the dust no more. Woman rise, thy penance o'er. Sit thou in the dust no more. Seize the scepter, ho scepter. hold the van equal with thy brother man. Seize the scepter, hold the van, equal with thy brother man. Let's do it one more time. <laughs> Women rise, okay? Ready, and. Woman rise, thy pen and sore, sit thou in the dust. Sit thou in the dust no more. Seize the scepter, seize the scepter, hold the van, equal with. Equal with thy brother man. 
Now that's a good song. It breaks out in many ways. But so many movements and revolutions ride on the felicitous phrase, and Mormon women have not been lacking in creating those phrases which they have been involved, when they have been involved in political manners. And here I would have spoken about the ERA and the IWI, but I've cut that section because of time limitations. Too bad. A recent request, I'm moving right on to Proposition 8, which Joanne is talking about too. A recent request for political help occurred in California when the church solicited funds and involvement to build support for Proposition 8, a measure to support traditional marriage. Eliza R. Snow, speaking publicly, spoke with breathtaking surety and conviction. The women's voices that follow are silent voices, recorded in the quiet rooms for the Claremont Oral History Program and used here anonymously. They show doubt, ambiguity, nuance. Few of the voices recorded wholeheartedly supported the issue. Some rejected it as a suitable position for the church. Some cited the pain of others. One sister said, I just felt the church had no business getting involved in that. They were trying to get people to go out and canvas neighborhoods and vote against it. I wouldn't have gone out there on a bet. I mean, I just did not think that the church should have been involved. That just wasn't the church's place. I disagreed with it totally. Some were more critical and dismissive. Mormons were pulled into political activity. Church buildings were used for political purposes. Heavy preaching supported a definition of marriage as between a man and a woman, therefore against any marriage between two people of the same gender. Those unwilling to join the battle were considered to have failed a religious test. The pain of the action brought to others, uh, as well as the ruptures in relationships, were cited by those who opposed the bill. I have a really good friend at school who is a lesbian. She got married over the summer and found out about my support of Proposition 8, and it pretty much destroyed our friendship. We'd been really good friends for about 15 years. We are collegial now, but we're not friends anymore. That was very painful for both of us. She just can't understand how I could belong to a church that hates her. Another sister made obedience her major concern. She felt the campaign overreached, but if asked, she would have complied. I am so glad I do not live in California and have to go door to door. It appears to me, and I can't even point to anything specific, but it appears to me that the church learned something from what happened in California. I don't think they will ask other states to fight the battle that way, but I'm obedient. Would I do it? I know I would but it would be very hard, very, very hard. There's a lot of obedience involved. This issue figured in the narratives of a number of women taking on a more causal relationship to daily life. Here are some of their stories. During Proposition 8, the Mormon Church mobilized to promote the proposition that would prevent gay marriage. This was an extremely painful moment for me as a Mormon because I saw good people mobilized to do something that I felt was really at heart unchristian and unkind. People want to marry. How is that a bad thing? We should be affirming this in every way. At first, I went to church every week. Eventually, I couldn't continue going to church. The breaking point came when a fellow ward member referred to Mormons who didn't support Proposition 8 as tares that needed to be separated from the wheat. So I was a tear, huh? I couldn't handle it anymore. I retreated and found my refuge at the United Church of Christ. They are an open and affirming congregation. The pastor is gay and has a lifelong partner. I love their services and their sermons and their music. I felt a real connection with the people there, and they were good to me. I'll always be grateful to them for being a refuge during the Proposition 8 crisis. Here's another story. Proposition 8 was bad. Proposition 8 was really bad. I left DC in July and they had literary, literally just read the letter over the pulpit in my sacrament meeting there saying, the elections are coming up in the fall. We do not hand out the ward list. We do not get involved. This is DC. That's what was read in my ward. 
Then I show up in Claremont, California, and they are reading over the pulpit the letter from the First Presidency saying, you must get involved in your community to help pass Proposition 8. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, these don't match. Here, A doesn't match B. In fact, they're complete opposites. We had a woman in the ward who was in charge of signups to do polling in the neighborhood. They were going around asking people how they would vote. Supposedly, they weren't trying to influence, but at the same time, they would say, well, here's our take on this. I can't even remember if we were yes or no. That's how much I didn't want to be a part of things. Every week, the women in charge would pass a list around, and people would sign up to go. I wouldn't do it, in part because I have friends who are gay, and I couldn't make it work in my head. Well, one day in Sunday school class, this woman bore her testimony and cried for more than 15 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating, aiding, because again, I was sitting there thinking, how much longer do I have to sit here before I can actually get up and leave because I can't breathe? I was basically having an anxiety attack. I had to leave the room, and she kept going. I couldn't deal with it. And then they had a fifth Sunday meeting. The one lawyer in the ward explained what was going to happen if Prop 8 didn't pass. They handed out copies of the letter from the First Presidency, and I was sitting in the back with a couple of radical friends. I finally got the letter, and it basically said, we believe in marriage between a man and a woman, do what you can, period. It didn't say go polling. It didn't say stand outside of the polling places and hold signs. It didn't say any of this. It said, do what your conscience tells you to do. And I thought, OK, all this stuff that the lawyer is telling us may come to pass. I'm not going to argue with him. But at the same time, none of this is in this letter. None of this. And I did what I could. I voted because that's what was asked of me. And that one was difficult. I think sometimes we tend to take whatever is political and try to fit it into our theology. But that's not what the letter said. They told us that the stake had to donate money, but that's not what the letter said. The letter said, do what you can. If the stake interprets it as we need to raise money to support this, well, that's fine if that's what they believe. But the letter to me said, do what you can. For the woman that was handing out the sign-up sheets, bearing her testimony, that was what she could do. More power to her, but don't do it around me. Here's another story. Our middle child and second son is a homosexual. He came out to us when he was 18, after a year at BYU. The fact that he said he was gay was no surprise to me. It was a surprise to his dad. I think that the church has not handled the issue well. I think, frankly, the church was wrong in California regarding the same-sex marriage. I do not see it's causing any damage to traditional couples. It was easy enough for the church to speak against homosexuality and assure members that it was an inclination, a choice, and that could be changed. Now the church no longer claims that, but the fact is that homosexuals still do not feel welcome in the church unless they stay tightly closeted. Just recently, we had a women's statewide meeting. My husband and I were asked to speak about same-sex attraction. I've made it a point to speak openly about it to anyone who is willing to listen. After our son came out, I said it was OK. It took him a while to talk about to his closest friends. It took courage to speak to them so he wouldn't lose them. Since then, I've made it a point that I would speak. But sadly, it is still something that's hidden. We know a number of people who are gay or lesbian and a surprising number of families who don't ever, ever mention it. It is an unnamed problem. They may mention a child who may be doing drugs, but never one who is gay. No, I don't think the church is handling it well. I understand that it's a difficult situation. It's not only our church, it's other churches as well. But when you say we love them and they are welcome, they're not really welcome. Church members are uncomfortable about asking gay children to stay with them if they come to visit. Should you invite their partners? One leader said that he would consider inviting them for dinner and for a visit, but not to stay. I said, we have other children who are not involved in the church. We are in a big city. They may live here with their girlfriends, with their boyfriends. They may have children. Do we deny them access to our homes, 
I find it so offensive. I said in the meeting, I'm just an ordinary woman and my husband and I love our children the best we can. Oftentimes we make mistakes, but it's hard for me to see that our son's mistakes are greater than those of our other children, or ours for that matter. My belief is that God loves them as much as he loves us and more than we can really conceive. For me to make a judgment that our gay children are not good enough to stay in our house is inconceivable. So I am afraid the church has not done very well with that issue. Organizations move slowly. It's very difficult for me to say that the church is always perfect and does everything right. It doesn't. It's just made up of people. It's made up of some very good people who try very hard, but they only understand what they understand. What we find with these accounts is narrative, a story in which Proposition 8 figures in changing the direction of the story. What we find is ambiguity, contradiction, and some humor, as one woman concludes. I often don't know which side of the gay debate I'm on. Personally, I believe that our son's same-sex marriage will be good for him and good for society. His marriage will in no way undermine my marriage or male-female marriage in general. On the other hand, I believe that a prophet stands at the head of our church who has spoken out against same-sex marriage. It's a good thing I have two hands. <laughs> These personal accounts of the California marriage debate show some varied reactions to political issues. When the church speaks, the response is never simple and in one voice. What people say in public under the pressure of public opinion is not necessarily what they would say privately. Still, these voices have great value in recording strong views, even when they are not spoken at the time. These attitudes can be used as historical evidence for attitudes and behavior. They may have a life later down the line. Let's get all those opinions and experiences recorded. Thank you.